So um, we have four colleges who'll be, uh, well, five uh, colleges that'll be joining us. We have um, Carlene from St. John's and St. Ben's, Liz from Gustavus, Adam from Carleton, and Anne from St. Kate's will be joining us just a little late. We're gonna go alphabetical by institution, which means Adam goes first, and each college rep will speak for about eight minutes or so, and then we'll have time for lots of conversation and questions. Um, Tom, you want to remind people they should use chat or and or Q and A. Yeah, use chat or Q and A um, if you've got questions for uh, these folks, and if you um, if if maybe a mute hasn't been unmuted or a screen isn't sharing, great, just put that in the chat, and I can pass that along to panelists. Um, so thanks for joining us. I should say Tom and I are with the Minnesota Private College Council, and we're glad to have this uh, going. And we'll get started with Adam. Thank you, Adam. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me give you a moment here. Uh, my name is Adam. I'm going to screen share for a moment here. I know you're all excited about that because we live in a world where screen share rules the day. And so give me a hot moment to get that set up, uh, and I will formally introduce myself. There. So, friends, are you able to see this screen okay? Uh, y yes, we can. I think you might, if you click the actual, yeah. Now it's perfect. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you. So uh, <clears throat> too many too many monitors is the world we live in. So uh, yeah, my name is Adam. I'm a Carleton graduate. I'm here to talk about Carleton briefly. I'm the director of admissions. I've been at Carleton for eight years now, which feels like a lifetime and a half. But being a student of the place you work at in admissions uh, has some uh, real benefits, I think. And I'm able to talk about the institution from a bunch of different lenses because before this window of time, I was a college teacher, so this is a really interesting spot to be in. So I'll just give you a few uh, facts about Carleton briefly here as we set things up. We're located in Northfield. Uh, it's fun to talk to what I imagine to be a pretty Minnesota-specific audience. Uh, <laughs> that means I don't have to talk about Minnesota the whole time because most of us already know what that means. It snows, spoiler. Um, but Northfield is 45 minutes south of the Twin Cities. I'm actually presenting to you today from Minneapolis, where I live, uh, but I rep uh, a college that is in a small town, a fairly idyllic version of it, just in the outskirts of the Twin Cities. Uh, it's the same town as St. Olaf College, another Minnesota private college council member. So uh, one small town of 20,000 people with 5,000 undergrads in it. It's pretty popular. So um, we're a full uh, liberal arts and sciences college and that only. We're about 2,000 students total carrying capacity. Uh, that's obviously a number that's a touch fluid these days as we're in a pandemic, but uh, that number is tracking fairly close to that right now. We do have all 50 states represented on our college campus in 42 countries. I think of note, uh, more than a third of our students right now for the class of 20 to 24 are basically first years through seniors on campus, will identify as domestic students of color, that is US uh, nationals who have a uh, racial identity that is something other than just white or unknown. A full additional 12% are international as well. We've worked really hard to sort of uh, make Carleton more representative of the uh, sort of world at large as it's evolving. Uh, and yes, we are a predominantly white institution in a historical sense, but uh, the most recent cohorts have been our most diverse ever, and we've worked really hard to sort of uh, make Carlton more reflective of workspaces we expect our graduates to go into. Additionally, a full third of our students will come from middle-income households. This is a pretty difficult uh, target to hit in admissions because um, we can first appear as a fairly expensive place until you go through our full financial aid process. Uh, that a third of our students come from what we call the great middle of American socioeconomic distribution uh, is uh, an important part of our uh, financial aid review and class selection process to make sure we're socioeconomically diverse as well as racially and ethnically diverse. Um, quick chat about campus here. Uh, sustainability uh, is sort of something we're able to do. Carleton is definitely embedded in its landscape and its landscape uh, has um, some uh, particular built-in advantages. One of those things is we have an 800 acre arboretum on the edge of our campus. Carleton feels like it's not quite as, hasn't terraformed campus in town the way some colleges have to to make it work. Means I think students feel a real sense of place and we've sort of uh, built into or leaned into that a little bit more closely. Two wind turbines on campus, one of which you can see in the very top center photo on the way back there. Um, the two of those together will generate more than half the electrical needs at Carleton. Uh, we're also in the final stage of switching over to full geothermal campus heating. I'm not going to say there's not been a lot of holes dug on Carlton's campus recently to make that happen. 
But the upshot is that in a single go, we'll be able to reduce our carbon footprint by 30%, and that comes online this winter, fingers crossed. So uh, it's a substantial investment by the campus um, sort of trustees, um, but with an eye towards carbon neutrality long before 2050, this is something that I think Carlton students take as axiomatic. So um, academically, we're a touch unusual because we're set up on an academic trimester schedule. That means uh, our students take almost exclusively three classes at a time over a 10 week term, and they just repeat that schedule three times a year. Carlton's deal is pretty explicit. Hey, three classes at once, so juggle less than a semester program but those three classes are gonna push you because you're covering roughly a semester's worth of material uh, in a given 10 week period. So it gets intense pretty quickly. All students start off with the first year argument and inquiry class. It's your standard first year seminar uh, and you're gonna be slotted into one of those in your first term. I think uniquely Carlton holds to a pretty hardcore uh, end of college career, uh, senior comprehensive project, a thesis if you will. Every student at Carlton calls them comps. They're meant to kick you into the deep end of academic study because frankly, uh, a whole bunch of our students go to graduate school later and this is your first chance to do original research in that vein. Our trimester really lends itself to off-campus study, which is quaint in 2020 when none of us are really getting on planes much right now, but the idea stands and we're committed to that idea that our students shouldn't complete their undergraduate experience if they're not also doing study and engagement and embedding in a culture far from home. Uh, I think that sort of uh, helps us out. I'd also say that as an admissions office, we have a real bias towards people who are um, of varied intellectual interest, but also really undecided. We love students who are interested in sort of applying and are like, I'm totally into econometrics, but I want to go into the ministry. I think I can make this work. And we're on board to support you in that mission. That is 100% our kind of student, so we look for that. For a liberal arts and science institution to have more than half of its students in heavy quantitative fields is something solid about the balance of our career. I would say community is the watchword of Carleton. There's not enough time to dwell on this too closely, but I will say at a glance, 96% uh, of our students live in college-owned housing on campus. We guarantee it all four years, and 100% of our students, including all of our first-year incoming students, will be living in college-owned housing right now. We have a retention rate of 97%, meaning most of our students who arrive come back for their sophomore year. Classes are tiny and the student-to-teacher ratio is equally tiny. I don't think this limits your uh, access to opportunity. I would say it makes it a more intimate learning experience, meaning our students and faculty and staff members live in a pretty tight, harmonious relationship together. together. And that really sort of opens up space for students to write their own ticket. We are, are, are proud of that. 77% uh, off to a, a grad school uh, within, should say five years, but it says four, apologies, typos, these. That's 2020. Uh, Carl does enjoy a reputation of being a warm and nerdy and inclusive and diverse campus. I, I'm probably not supposed to type the word nerdy in a PowerPoint, but I got to tell you, it's the quickest shorthand to it. Uh, one of the most exciting challenges of my work right now is sort of pivoting uh, to create that experience uh, in, <laughs> in a COVID only or virtual learning environment, which a number of our classes are pivoting to right now. And so as a way to get to that, I'm going to show a trailer for a class that's shown up right now. It's a minute long, so bear with me. Uh, this is a technical leap for me, but this is how our faculty are attempting to capture Carlton's learning experience inside of a virtual environment. They've come pretty far in a short window of time. Friends, can you still see, I will quick pivot to this screen share. God willing, I can get there. <clears throat> a uh, YouTube screen, yes? Yes. Can you hear it now? Mm, not yet. It's just starting to play and we cannot hear volume. Never mind. I will let this one go then. I don't know how to get it go. So. <clears throat> Whoa, gotta stop the screen. Hey, share. Adam. Yeah. Um, why don't you try and screen share that one more time? And in the in the below, in the lower left-hand corner, there's a two boxes that says share screen uh, for video and share audio. You might, we might have better, um, might have better success that way. I, I dream of that world, but I can't find those boxes, okay. Fred. That's okay. okay. So I'm at time, and that's okay. There's plenty of ways to do it. Suffice it to say, the big challenge for Carlton is making that community come alive, and our faculty's efforts to sort of pitch the enthusiasm of Carlton in a way that hits that warm, inclusive, and nerdy uh, uh, register has been one of the more uh, heartwarming parts of my summer. And so that faculty handled that just fine, as many faculty will do. So with that, uh, I will just uh, hand it off uh, to others on call. So thank you for your patience, everyone. Thank you, Adam.
So we're next moving to um, St. John's and St. Ben's with, uh, with Carlene. Yes. Thanks, everyone. My name is Carlene, uh, and it looks uh, different. It sounds different than it's spelled. It's like a car leaning to the side. I'll put that up at the end. Um, yeah, welcome, Anne, who, who made it from St. Kate's, too. So we're all, the gang's all here now. Um, I'm going to screen share in, well, actually, I'll screen share it now. And I'm just going to launch into this. Um, we, the reason, you know, as John said, it's alphabetical. We are the College of St. Benedict with St. John's University, which is why we follow Carleton, but proceed Gustavus. If you're wondering, how did St. John sneak in there? We didn't cut in the line, I promise. Uh, so I want to focus on, I really like acronyms, and we're in a very virtual, not acro, well, acronyms too, but I really like um, metaphors. So I want to, if you'll entertain me, I want to think about the liberal arts as a set of, here we go, filters. Are you all able to see the PowerPoint? Yes, we can see it well. Okay, wonderful. So I want you to think of Instagram filters and um, whether you use Instagram or Snapchat, uh, you don't have to do it right now unless you're not skilled in that. But I think Adam can help you from Carlton, given our technical prowess. No, I not, shouldn't tease like that. Um, if you think about taking a picture and then um, adding a filter to it. I think that the filters are a way that we can think about the liberal arts and then I'll highlight some of the ways that those are um, in action at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's uh, specifically. So uh, this is me. I know that um, I'm screen sharing right now so you might not be able to see my little head in the corner. Um, and here is Carlene with a few Instagram filters. Uh, I'm a big fan of black and white. Uh, you, you, you see them scrolling whether you've used Instagram or seen a niece or nephew or a a child using that. Um, and my kind of the, the metaphor for me is that um, just as filters on um, for photos or images illuminate and emphasize different aspects of an image, right? They can, they can um, emphasize contrast, they can sharpen or soften, they can de-emphasize something like de-emphasizing color with black and white, um, or they can uh, emphasize color as with a certain filter. Um, so if you think about that, um, again, that is a metaphor for, to me, the liberal arts um, and having studied in it in undergrad, I'm a graduate of the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University in 2007. Um, the liberal arts is like a collection of filters and each filter is a way of thinking about the world and understanding the world in the past, present and future. Um, I knew conceptually that I was coming to a liberal arts college when I matriculated or enrolled at the Saint, at College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. Um, now having worked in admission for four years going on five, and also having studied a master's in social work at a, at a not liberal arts college, at a large flagship university in Texas. Um, I appreciate the liberal arts much more now than I could have at age um, 18 to 21 when I was studying at a liberal arts institution. Uh, so it's really fun to be sharing uh, with these incredible uh, other private college partners um, and colleagues, and then also with you all today. Um, so kind of extending then from the filters to how does that connect to liberal arts um, or how are liberal arts as filters? Some of these filters may be more commonly applied, you know, when oftentimes we may think of the liberal arts as like literature or history, philosophy, or the social sciences, um, whether or not they're archaic or not uh, in, in perception. Certainly the past is a really important aspect of the liberal arts, um, but uh, there are some that may conjure or come to mind. I do want us to note that the liberal arts um, is neither politically liberal, as we often hear liberal, um, nor is it um, consists solely of the fine arts. So it can be a little bit of a, a misnomer as we understand things. So I think the filter idea helps us get away from um, how those words may feel as we now know them in our, our especially in our COVID era um, and in our current uh, landscape and environment in Minnesota and in our country as well. Um, so we may have some filters that are more commonly known or come to mind, and then some filters can be more specialized, right, as with the sciences. And oftentimes there's a dichotomy of the sciences as not liberal arts, um, when in fact there are ways to um, teach the sciences with very much a liberal arts mindset or apply some of these different filters, if you want to think about it that way, to physics or to chemistry or to biology. Um, as ways of thinking about the world. Um, so I want to get really concrete now with the time left to me, and then we'll certainly be able to um, 
answer some specific questions in the Q&A portion. Uh, but in terms of what is the liberal arts in action at St. Ben's and St. John's, there are three things that I want to highlight. Um, career, as a career preparation, I want to highlight experiential learning, and then thirdly, our honors program in particular. So let's first think about career. There are a couple of um, academic programs that I want to highlight that are very interdisciplinary or liberal arts in, um, in their design. So our, we have a, uh, two majors that I want to highlight. Um, one is called interdisciplinary science, and one is called exercise and health science. Interdisciplinary science is really a major designed for people um, that either want to go into the health profession. So you can think of it as like as close to a pre-med quote unquote major as you can get without majoring in something pre-professional because that just doesn't happen at the undergraduate level. Um, but interdisciplinary science can also include um, aspects of the environment. Um, and if you think about the health professions, that can be for students anywhere um, from public health to uh, medicine, to physician assistant, to allied health like social work. Um, so even for whether a profession um, is recognized with an undergraduate degree or requires graduate work, the interdisciplinary science um, or integrative science is even a better word, integrative science um, is hallmarked by three seminars throughout the four years of the major that are integration points. So you can think about how do we explicitly connect psychology, with nutrition, with biology and anatomy, with cellular chemistry. And then how do I answer that as a di future dietitian? Um, those are examples. Or with the environment, how does history meld with public policy? And what does, what does that mean for um, our arboretum? Just like Adam talked about the arboretum at Carleton, we have an arboretum at St. Ben's and St. John's also. So how do we steward the land that we are on um, and care for the environment as we've been doing for 150 years? Um, the exercise in health science is really created with an, um, an eye towards people that want to focus in health sciences around um, the body's movement. And so for people that want to become physical therapists or even occupational therapists, um, how do we think about the different skill sets in both com in communication and in um, sports psychology and rehabilitation sciences? And how do we really introduce stu students to um, the research mindsets as well as um, the, different, the different knowledge and skills um, from different disciplines that, that come together in a career like physical therapy or occupational therapy. The second thing I want to experience or I want to highlight is experiential opportunities. So just as Adam talked about, um, it, I, I undergrad experience really would feel perhaps incomplete um, without experiences off campus. Um, and so one thing I wanted to highlight is the international studies component or study abroad. Certainly that's been truncated and in many ways made impossible by COVID. Um, but we are hoping it's a go for spring. We'll see. Um, even if it's not, the ability for students to engage in the communities around us outside of the, the confines, or not confines, but outside the boundaries, you could say, of the college campus. What happens when you step off campus? Um, and then also related to the career in terms of academics, we have a really robust experience and professional development office, which goes by um, the initials XPD, again, for experience and professional development. And under that umbrella of services is everything from career services, um, on-campus career fairs, uh, resume writing workshops, cover letters, mock interviews on campus, to service learning and um, engagement in the community. And so looking at the, the breadth of experiences and the different ways, again, to think about the filter metaphor, the different ways that um, we participate in the community helps illuminate different ways that we're learning in the classroom. And then thirdly, um, our honors program is brand new. It's called the Honors Program at College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. And the focus is leadership for the common good. And so, um, Unlike uh, a lot of high school experiences with honors or um, advanced placement or international baccalaureate programs, perhaps college in the schools, where it really is a, a next level of homework and testing, sometimes test anxiety, I remember experiencing that. The honors program at St. Ben's and St. John's is designed through, um, through to, do, to really support a community of scholars, high achieving scholars, um, intellectually and also um, 
in terms of ambition to impact their communities positively and however students define their community. So we admit 60 students per cohort. So we'll have um, 60 times four as this um, program rolls out over the next four years. We have our first uh, class starting this fall and students take five seminar courses that go from really um, examining what the common good means um, from all kinds of different majors. So students aren't uh, limited to a certain major or minor for the honors program. And then it culminates in a project implementing um, uh, some sort of intervention or innovation for social good by the time they're seniors and then presenting on that. Uh, so th those are three ways that I see the liberal arts really concretely in action at St. Ben's and St. John's. Certainly there are more that I'd be happy to answer or cover in the Q&A section. Um, and then maybe we can talk about um, COVID a little bit more during that time, but wanted to highlight those three. Again, I'm Carleen Quist, and I just want you to think about filters as it pertains to the liberal arts. Um, it can mean a lot of indecisiveness because there are so many filters that we can utilize to look at our world um, in terms of the different academic approaches. Um, but also some of them feel more right or look more right for us than others. And so I think it's also important to know ourselves be attentive to what feels right and best for us. Um, and then we can really um, impact the world with our sp specific skill set um, and ambitions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, uh, Carly. You're welcome. Stop share. And we are now jumping over to Gustavus Adolphus College and Liz Vine. Thanks, Liz. Great. Thank you. Am Liz, I unmuted now? You are unmuted now. You're Great. Good. Thank you. Thanks again for joining this conversation surrounding the value of the liberal arts. My name is Elizabeth Vine and I'm a senior admission counselor and 2015 Gusty grad. And I will spend some time today talking about a liberal arts experience at Gustavus. We view the liberal arts as a philosophy of education, really preparing students with broad knowledge and transferable skills um, in hoping to cultivate a strong sense of social responsibility and strong sense of ethics and values. If you look at the classes you will take in your four years at Gustavus, so pretty you know, concrete at the ground level here, what does that look like? Because when I was in high school, I thought, you know, if you're a math major, you take 90% math classes, but refreshingly so, that's just not the case. So about a third of the courses will be in, um, in the liberal arts curriculum, so across nine or ten areas of academia here at Gustavus, and then the next third in your major, and the final third are electives. So really hoping to give students time to dig deep in areas before officially declaring a major. We have a unique academic calendar year where there's four classes in the fall, one in January, and four again in the spring. So January term, J term is what we call that month of January where it's um, yeah a short sprint and you're covering a lot of information, rigorous classes. So getting after one, one class at a time then in January. So uh, there are a ton of options for students during the month of January. Students receive credit for internships, study away programs for the month and outstanding classes on campus. Really through the liberal arts, Gustavus graduates are prepared to enter the workforce with skills employers seek. So we believe that this style of education breeds you know, strong communication, analytical skills, research, leadership, decision-making, creativity. Uh, my brother is a liberal arts graduate, not from Gustavus, but we still love him. And he was saying he's a CPA now, an accountant, and he was like, yeah, but liberal arts grads always they're the ones that know how to write emails. So skills that really, you know, there's the technical training skills and, and we equip students with those too, but ultimately reading and writing and research that um, it's going to build a strong sense of work ethic and a strong work ethic and help you to really contribute to your teams down the road. Um, participation in athletics, fine arts, and other extracurriculars are really really important aspects of the liberal arts at Gustavus. So there's obviously a ton of learning that goes on in the classroom, but we all know that what you do outside of the classroom really matters to 
Um, we compete in the MIAC, uh, Minnesota Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, with these fine institutions also on the call with us today. Um, Gussie student athletes have earned 114 academic All-American honors, ranking us first in the MIAC. So we want to win championships, but we also want to perform in the classroom. And we have a strong legacy of excellence in the fine arts. And one thing that I loved coming to Gus Davis was, I, don't know, I think in my family and at my high school, you know, sports really got the majority of the funding and attention. But here we lift up and do a lot of things really well. So for some young people, you know, fine arts is your, your really your passion. It's one of your many interests and talents. So our music ensembles are open audition, so you can be an economics major and the lead trombone player. So we have um, music ensembles that tour locally, nationally, and internationally. And really, like I said, you know, athletics, fine arts, other student groups prov provide important settings for students to gain experience in leadership, time management, and creativity, all supporting the learning taking place in the classroom at a liberal arts institution. We are passionate about supporting students as they dig deep into career exploration. And uh, that's really a hallmark of the liberal arts, again, at Gus Davis, because we want to equip you to, to head out into the world and lead purposeful lives. And as you can see here, roughly 58% of Gusties will complete an internship and more than 90% of our graduates will participate in some type of experiential education, whether that's student teaching, service learning, research, study away um, during their time at Gus Davis. About one third of our graduates go immediately into graduate or professional school, and ultimately more than 75% of our graduates continue their education beyond Gus Davis. So you're thinking, what can I do? You know, what, does, what do you do with a classics major? What do you do with an English major? Really, uh, we see history majors in IIT and elementary education majors in pharmaceutical sales. And we love those stories and really lift up students who pursue what they're passionate about, but ultimately go on to do great things in a variety of career fields. Um, you'll find gusties all over the world after graduation from every Fortune 500 company in Minnesota to serving in the Peace Corps in Botswana. Gusties attend top medical schools, thrive in competitive graduate programs, and start their own small businesses. So again, you can, you can study a variety, you know, pursue what you're interested in here, and then use Gus Davis and you know, what you do outside of the classroom really as a launching pad to wherever you want to go. And we believe that with the Gustavus education, Gusties are well equipped to succeed in an ever-changing world. Gustavus re recently featured different perspectives surrounding the case for the liberal arts in a recent publication. And I'll just share a few anecdotes here. Um, a few statistics cited uh, here that about 4% of undergraduates nationwide attended a liberal arts college, yet, such colleges have produced 9% of Fortune 500 company, Fortune 500 CEOs, excuse me, 23% of U.S. educated Nobel laureates, 27% of U.S. presidents, and 14% of tenured Harvard law professors. 74% uh, of surveyed employers recommend the liberal arts as the best way to prepare for success in today's global economy. Gustavus, we proudly embrace this liberal arts teaching, and here's what a, a couple you know, professors and students and alums had to say about why they chose it and what it means to them. Nursing professor Heidi Meyer states, as a nurse, you'll never practice alone and are an integral part of the healthcare team. Our students bring arts and humanities perspective into a healthcare setting discipline, discipline, excuse me, heavily focused on evidence-based practice. As a nurse, they provide holistic care and having a broad perspective develops our, nurse, our nursing graduates to safely care for individuals, families, communities, and the greater global society. Physics student, Ben Roram. I came to Gustavus to study hard science, but the liberal arts cur curriculum lured me with the big question, what does it mean to be human? The writing skills, he said, were a, bon were a bonus. I know that will be, these will be necessary in a career. So will interpersonal communication and critical thinking skills. 
People who study hard sciences, he says, can get narrowly focused in their field. I think liberal arts in the humanities makes well-rounded people. And finally, alum Steve Epp, actor, playwright, and director, says, everybody did everything. It was very disciplined. He carries it with him. And the lessons of intentional storytelling too. There was a great emphasis on what are you putting into the world? Why are we telling that story now? That's been the bottom line of any piece of theater I've been involved in. In new talent he seeks, people who use their own imaginations are open to other ways of thinking and can, and can engage with what's going on. Thank you for your time. I hope you, um, I hope you ask, I hope our information leads to a good question and answer discussion. And again, my name is Liz Akis Davis and thank you for having me. Great, thank you, Liz. I really appreciate that. And um, all those, those quotes were fantastic. Um, we're gonna jump now to our last panelist, Anne from St. Kate's is with us from the, the beautiful St. Paul neighborhood. All right, Anne. All right, hi everyone. Stand by while I share my screen. Um, okay, all right, so. At St. Kate's, um, our mission is to lead an influence, and we'll talk a little bit about St. Kate's broadly. I think it's important to put it in perspective, but I also think that uh, talking about specifically how we lead an influence through the liberal arts is central as part of this conversation. So, let me see. Okay, so St. Catherine University, also known as St. Kate's, we're located in the Highland Park neighborhood of St. Paul, pretty darn close to McAllister, St. Thomas, a number of different private colleges close to the U of M as well. Um, St. Kate's is the nation's largest private women's college, which automatically makes us fairly unique. That being said, even though we're the nation's largest private women's college, we're not large. In the College for Women, which is our traditional bachelor seeking age students, we have about 1,800 students. Our average class size is 17, and our student to faculty ratio is 11 to 1. And really what that means for you as a student is that regardless of major, regardless of classes that you're taking, you are getting to know your professors and your classmates. Along with the women's college component, St. Kate's is also a Catholic university. We were founded by a really incredible group of women, the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet in 1905. Um, and St. Kate's was not founded as a finishing school. St. Kate's was founded as college, right? This was a time before women could vote and women's education was taken incredibly seriously. That being said, um, if you're concerned because you're not Catholic, don't be. About a quarter of our students identify as Catholic and everybody else is across the board when it comes to faith tradition. So we have students who are Catholic um, and we have a really robust campus ministry, but we also in our campus ministry have a Muslim spiritual leader. So know that your needs will be met in that way. Our classes are very discussion based and that's regardless of what you study. Um, we've got more than 60 majors, 30 minors and 10 pre-professional programs. And some of those pre-professional programs lead to graduate programs on our own campus. So what does the liberal arts look like at St. Kate's? Or how do we frame an education at St. Kate's? You can see pretty specifically from this slide what our core requirements look like. That's what we call our liberal arts requirements. And a lot of the things that you see are pretty classic liberal arts things. The humanities, foreign language, fine arts. But there are two things that really define a St. Kate's education. The first is a course called The Reflective Woman. So first semester, this is really our first year experience. The people in this group are also in your orientation group. And you spend the semester digging deep and really thinking about what does it mean to have a St. Kate's education? Um, what does identity look like? within our society. Where do you come from? Um, you study a number different of different approaches to truth 
and evidence, which I think is an exceptionally timely thing to consider in our world of um, what claims to be fake news. How do you determine what is the truth? And then finally, how do we work towards community and justice? And that really leads us back to the idea that we were founded by a group of sisters with social justice at the heart of what they do. So you do that during your first year. During your senior year, you take a course called the Global Search for Justice, which again is going back to that social justice idea. And it's really a capstone liberal arts seminar. This is taken by all of our students, regardless of major. And it's an exam, excuse me, it's an examination of the conditions of justice or an extreme lack thereof um, for people outside of the European or North American majority culture. A lot of these courses do focus on things like women's health, um, environmental justice, and especially related to women. And this course can be taken either domestically over the course of a semester or over January term as an international course. So I next I'm going to talk about um, one of our very specific majors, it's pretty unique to St. Kate's, and how the liberal arts plays out in that major. And that major is American Sign Language and Interpreting. Um, St. Kate's has the only accredited interpreting program in Minnesota. And I think it's important to think about the difference between translating and interpreting. So first, on our campus we have something called the Katie Center. And the Katie Center is focused around creating opportunities for women of color to become American Sign Language interpreters and increasing access to deaf and hard of hearing folks of color to um, those very essential sign language services for them. Um, and the really the two main focuses of that center are mental health translation and education translation and interpreting. So if we're thinking about technical skills, if you're an American Sign Language and interpreting major, you need to be able to sign fluently. You need to be able to communicate with um, folks who need your services. And American Sign Language is structured very differently as a language than spoken English. Um, so you're taking a number of those courses. You're also taking classes on translating. If you're translating in a healthcare setting, you need to know some pretty, sub, um, excuse me, sub, whoa, sometimes language is difficult. You need to know some pretty specific terminology uh, regarding healthcare and bodies and illness. But then we think about what does it really mean to be an interpreter? If you watch the governor's updates throughout um, this time of coronavirus and you've seen his interpreter who is so incredibly dynamic and is not just signing but is using um, their whole body to communicate, that's where the liberal arts really come in. So first, our American Sign Language and Interpreting students have to take a couple of theater courses to get outside of just their hands and really get into their bodies um, and to use their bodies as tools, right? And theater is a fantastic way of doing that. Our students are also required to take a number of English electives, including things like language and society, language as power, and, in, and linguistics. And in those courses, students really learn um, the power dynamic of the power and privilege you have as an English speaker versus the power and privilege or lack thereof that you have um, as somebody who speaks the lang a language that is not part of dominant society. They also learn things like basic structure of language, how things are broken down, that sort of thing. And finally, they take ethics courses as well because our students who are interested in things like American Sign Language are there because they want to help, right? They wanna make the world a better place, but your duties as an interpreter are fairly limited. You are interpreting. You can't be the person who advocates for the people that you're working with. Um, and for a lot of our students, that's really challenging because they are doing this to kind of change the world. So I think interpreting is a great example of the incredible balance of technical skills and humanities and that kind of thing um, that you can get out of a liberal arts education. So it's at St. Kate's, we have the classic humanities majors, but we also have a number of um, healthcare majors or pre-healthcare majors. And 
our students are not um, here just because they want those skills, but they're here to truly be helpers and change makers. And I personally think that to do that, you need to be able to dig deeper in your liberal arts courses. Um, let's see. And I'm happy to talk more specifics about any of what I've talked about. I'm also happy to talk about things like St. Kate's COVID plans for the fall. But thank you all so much for being here and taking the time to listen. Thank you, Anne. I appreciate that. So um, uh, a question that often comes up around liberal arts is what it really means. And I wonder, um, as admission folks who've been dealing with the public for s several years, um, I'm, I'm curious if you could share some of the qu uh, misunderstandings that exist about the liberal arts that you've heard from parents or students themselves um, and maybe set the record straight. Would anyone have anything that comes to mind? Any of our panelists? I'm going to call on Adam then. Adam, what's a misunderstanding about the liberal arts? Man, it's good to be the facilitator of this conversation, huh, John? I know. I gotta <laughs> yeah. think it's tougher questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's a lot. I, I would say that one of the big ones that we spend some time talking about, and the reason I talk about it in our presentation, is that I think people conceive of liberal arts as as an area of study that is primarily about the humanities. And I think every institution here is certainly proud of our humanities offerings and those areas in the fine arts and languages and cultural uh, sort of fluency and competency. But more than half the students at my institution study uh, a hard science. They are becoming doctors. Like this is a fantastic place to start out in your trajectory to become a PhD in physics or you know, head off into um, high finance or something like that. We, we do that well. So the, word, the area is not, the, the notion is not about specializing in the humanities side uh, of the sort of academic uh, spectrum. It's more about becoming well-rounded and understanding that even in an area which isn't an academic specialty of yours, by becoming competent and, and comfortable in that learning environment, you ask better questions. You become the more dynamic person in any learning environment. Frankly, uh, you're going to become a menace at cocktail parties for the rest of your life because you were brave enough to take that class far from your comfort zone, but are still willing to hold court in that. That's not a bad thing in, in the world. It'll open up some doors. Sounds like a um, Someone else dangerous cocktail party, Adam. Um, OK, I had a question for uh, Carlene. Um, I was reading a quote about, uh, from someone who is, uh, you know, being a proponent of the liberal arts, who is speaking about its power to create a, a heterogeneous education as opposed to homogeneous. And I guess I'm, uh, you gave some great examples of, of specific ways St. John St. Ben's nurtures through a few different kind of programmatic direction, you know, efforts, um, some aspects of that. But I, I guess I'm wondering if you could think of an example uh, it could be from education of someone you know or students you've worked with, where where it sort of deliberately gets shaken up, shook up, and they're having a, a less homogenous education than maybe they even thought they were going to be receiving. Um, someone maybe who thinks they're going to do X but ends up doing learning about a whole bunch more than they ever thought they were going to. Yeah, that's actually that's. I'm glad you tacked that onto the end because that's the direction I was going to take it. Um, it a, a lot of times I hear. Um, my admission colleagues from St. Ben's and St. John's and others talk about the kind of the demands, um, the, de the, the, um, the majors and minors that are most in demand for prospective students or students when they're applying to college. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, those are things like engineering and nursing and business and accounting, um, some of the, the more lucrative careers and also more well-known and so if we look at what students intentions are when they come into college as they note on their uh, application for admission um, as students know themselves and understand the world there tend to be a, a kind of a top five or a top ten that are not surprising um, and if students stuck with if all those students stuck with those pathways it would be a, a fairly um, homogenous you could say or, or kind of an education of like-minded students who are pursuing very similar things and what we find at St. Ben's and St. John's and I would I would guess that it's pretty true at um, 
these companion institutions also, students discover sociology, it's, it's discover the study of cultures for the first time ever. I took my first peace studies class after I decided I had a hard pass on education. Uh, and I became a peace studies major and then became a social worker in my graduate school career and, and practice education as a social worker. Um, I have uh, students who study accounting and finance and sociology. We have students who are integrative science and Hispanic studies and really want to serve as uh, medical providers either internationally with doctors across borders or serve here in St. Cloud and uh, central Minnesota and meet the, better meet the needs of, of um, immigrant and, and also central Minnesotan born families who prefer Spanish um, as their, their language to communicate about their bodies and their health. And so uh, what we're finding to, to tie this back to the kind of the demand is that this, the kind of the, the graduating college students are really experiencing 60 majors and 60 some minors, even though they've come in intending with like 10. And so I see that as very much this heterogeneous or like diversified um, um, experience in college. And when students from those different majors and minors, as they discover them, are in classes together, by nature, it's a very diverse um, intellectual experience because they're sharing from their different perspectives. Thank you. Um, Liz, I had a question for you that, um, that is going to call on you to be a little more pointed, maybe, um, than, uh, than we've been on this conversation so far, I think. And, and that's regarding the fact that there, there are a lot of uh, institutions out there that offer uh, a liberal arts opportunity. And I guess if you had a student or f uh, families that were considering going to a larger uh, a larger university um, that has a lot of, uh, a larger public university that has a lot of different uh, focus areas, including uh, graduate research and all that. Um, what do you think maybe um, can get lost there when it comes to actually pursuing the liberal arts that won't at an institution like Gustavus or any other smaller private college as we have on this call? What, what, what makes smaller private colleges better able to deliver on the liberal arts? Right, so I believe that the professor or faculty kind of compensation really dictates how the, and the structure of the school dictates the learning style that happens. And so, you know, at Gustavus, we're an R3 institution. So our faculty are paid to teach and really believe in that intimate learning environment. And as you go, you know, bigger and bigger schools, you know, with the, the big flagship universities are one, they're paid to do research and that both, you know, change the world through different different ways and outcomes. But I, we encourage students um, to really think about what do you, class size, right, determines a, a lot of a student's experience. And so in small classes like schools on this call have, you're able to build relationships with professors. And so while we are all undergrad and we all we have only undergrad students at Gustavus. You can fulfill the prereqs to pursue almost any graduate level degree that you're you're aiming for. But I think small colleges, really with the value of community and relationship building, just open doors. And that's something I I challenge students. I think it's easy as a high school student to underestimate the value of the relationships that you'll build with faculty members. And I know folks on this call too have many stories on just how those relationships and the faculty's expertise shape and really change your understanding. And like Carlene mentioned, I mean, people will, folks will come in um, pursuing one path, but then maybe pivot and end up maybe in a similar, similar place that may be different. And I think the research opportunities, study away and uh, relationships you build with faculty. Starting your first year are hallmarks of a small liberal arts institution and, and certainly something that we hope to provide students at Gustavus. Thank you. Um, Anne, uh, I was curious about um, the, one of the issues actually that Liz had brought up that was helpful was she was talking about the amount of courses that are expected of someone in a, pursuing a major um, that may fall in that major and that it's not always, you know, you're not going to take 90% of your classes in math if you're a math major. Um, can you reflect on that for your institution? Um, the idea of 
kind of how much do you kind of get locked up in your major versus the ability to take courses, maybe requirements for you to take more courses that push you um, in different areas? That's a great question. And really it depends on a couple of different things. A student who is studying nursing, um, much of their time is spent working on major requirements or prerequisites for the major. There is not nearly as much room for them to explore, but there is still built in room for students to explore. Um, as opposed to somebody like an English major where the number of credits required specifically for that English major is considerably lower than the nursing major specified credits, right? So students who are on track to do something, especially in a healthcare field, they have less room to explore. There is still some room to explore. Um, students in the hard sciences and the humanities have much more of an ability to do that. So it really depends at St. Kate's. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious about this idea of, um, uh, of discomfort, the idea that uh, getting pushed out of a comfort zone and, and, and experiencing discomfort may be something that we're searching for in college. That's kind of, that's, uh, it seems inherent in a liberal arts education uh, at times. Um, or, or some people uh, note that, but that's also hard to communicate to students and, and families because who wants to be uncomfortable? Um, can you speak to that a little bit about how, how colleges can be places where you kind of want to experience some discomfort, hear ideas you're not familiar with, get pushed a little bit off your assumptions? Is that, is that something that, you, um, that you, you've tried at times to, to communicate with families? and? And how have you talked about that? Who would like to jump in on that? I would, I'd love to start. If All I right. can um, start with another kind of a metaphor, a way to think about it. Um, I played hockey, ice hockey for two years as a peace studies major, and I'm still working through that um, paradox. But um, I think as I developed as a hockey player in terms of strength and, and agility, um, I, I had to push my body in weightlifting and in sprinting and conditioning beyond what was comfortable for my body. Um, certainly not to injure myself as an athlete in physical exertion and certainly not to injure um, injure anyone else in like a violent way, although hockey can be a very like certainly an aggressive sport um, in the ways that football and other um, other sports are. Um, so that discomfort in like pushing my muscles so that they can grow and strengthen is really important, but it's not it's not painful or it's not damaging to my body or to others. And that's a that's a helpful way for me to think about discomfort intellectually or in terms of what what my world, how I understand my world, um, to become uncomfortable isn't to inflict pain on yourself necessarily. And the goal isn't to tear down the, the knowledge you have about yourself and the world around you, that context, especially that Anne was talking about, like with the, the, the women's experience class, um, but rather to push you further so you can strengthen your muscles, right? You can strengthen the ways that you think about the world. And we often talk about critical thinking. Um, if I never lifted heavier weights, my muscles wouldn't have gotten stronger. And I think similarly, if we're not doing the kind of the academic weightlifting and thinking in different ways, if we're only ever thinking as a, a medical practitioner, only ever thinking as a physicist, or only ever thinking as an economist, um, we can, other ways of understanding the world and, and um, resolving problems or doing problem solving can atrophy. Um, or just think about a language also, like if you don't use a language, they say if you don't use it, you lose it. And so um, challenging ourselves to think in different ways um, certainly is uncomfortable. Um, but again, not in a way that can harm us, rather in a way that can actually help us understand the world and relate to one another better. Thank you. Anyone else on discomfort or we can... I'll actually okay. jump on it if I can. Also, because I would, I would just compliment uh, Carlene's approach to this by talking about, um, I like guess, central tenet of residential colleges like the ones we're talking about here is that we live in tight concert with people, and I think we're we're pretty clear about how we built it into our model that you should be living next to people who have fundamentally different lifestyles, experiences, aspirations, ambitions than you do. And it's in the act of building empathy for people whose lives are so different than your own that you begin to recognize um, 
things about your own life that are maybe things you should have thought more critically about in the past, um, maybe some privileges taken for granted, maybe some opportunities squandered because you had sort of thought about something in a different lens and it's in the presence of coming by someone who is fighting very hard for everything they have in the dint of ordinary conversation in the dining hall or in the bathroom or the stuff that makes the, that constitutes most of ordinary life that a lot of us become more comfortable with a more complicated world and also recognize something approaching the shared humanity of our fellow inhabitants of the planet. I think, I think that it's been a huge advantage of a true liberal arts college is that you are living in close concert with real people and you're at a scale where you can get to know them as human beings, not just bodies in the classroom space. So I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna say the classroom and intellectual side of it isn't important, it's transformative, but I would say it's complemented so nicely by the scale at which, and, and the latent empathy built into the curriculum at places like this that really makes this place come to life, so. Thank you. Say we uh, have a question um, that came up in the Q&A area, um, which is a topic we, we address, but it's asking for a, a good clarification or confirmation perhaps. Do small liberal arts schools always provide a stronger liberal arts education than larger comprehensive universities do? Um, we talked a little bit about the differences with Liz about what can be available at a smaller institution versus a larger. Um, uh, but does anyone want to speak uh, more to that, given the question that came in? Yeah, I'm happy to touch on that. Um, I think that I know that at any of our schools, compared to any big school, the opportunities are similar, but a piece of this whole thing is the accessibility. How accessible is it at a big school as an undergraduate student to do collaborative research? Really unlikely. Um, and there, I think one of the big differences is kind of the investment in professors in their students, like Liz mentioned. Our professors are here to teach and they have incredible amounts of knowledge and education and they want to develop that in other people. And that's not to say that at a big university you couldn't find that, um, but I think that that's a hallmark of going to a smaller liberal arts school. Great. Well, that we're just about at time, so that seems like a good place to stop and thank the good folks who joined us on this panel. So Liz, Adam, Anne, and Carlene, um, thanks so much for, for joining us. Tom, is there anything we should be telling the folks calling in? Yeah, I'll be sending out a follow-up with a recording uh, of this discussion and some links to contact information of our panelists and uh, a few resources from uh, the council that you might find uh, valuable. And thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.